Good morning, Living Grace. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I would encourage you today to lift up your arms and praise God because when your arms are in the air and you're praising the Lord, you can't think anything that's external except for him. Let praise be your weapon that silences any enemy, that any anxiety, everything. Lord, we just want to come and we want to bring glory and honor to you as we praise you. In Jesus' name. That silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we pra let faith be a song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that calls the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you.
Wish I could tell you Wish, Wish I could describe it, it. But I can contain it, it. Can't keep it to myself yep. There are enough colors To paint the whole picture Not enough words to ever say what I found Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy He is merciful and powerful Who are we talking about? That's my king We declare the glory Give him all honor, all together worthy. Who are we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who are we talking about? That's my king. I'm letting the rocks cry. Without joining the chorus, there aren't enough notes to make the harmony. It's the song of the angels, we'll sing through the ages. It's all of the earth and heaven's symphony. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, he is merciful and powerful. Who are we talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory, give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who are we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who are we talking about? That's my king. That's my king, that's my God, that's my shepherd, my protector. That's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender. That's my king, that's my God, that's my shepherd. My protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender. Who we talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory, give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory. Give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who are we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who are we talking about? That's my king. 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 Matthew seven twenty four through twenty seven says, Build your house on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. <sighs> There's, the Psalms are beautiful, and the more I read them, it's not like I've never read them, but I read them again and again. And, David was hiding out from King Saul because David had been anointed and King did, or Saul didn't want him. But long story short, David hid out. He ran for his life. He hid. In all those times, he I don't know if he wrote the Psalms during or after, but he Psalm 62 says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress I shall not be shaken. 
Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Mm. He is our rock. He is our solid ground. He is our defender. He is our comforter. He is the lifter of our head. He is our song. When everything in the world seems shaken and things are coming at you, I just pray that God would put a song in your heart and that you remember his promises because his word is true. And when you look at his, when you read the word, let it penetrate your heart and let it just lift you out of the junk and the mire. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Blessed assurance, glory divine. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus. 
Jesus is mine. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Blessed assurance, glory divine. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus is Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. God, your so good God you're so good God you're so good you're so good to me You're so good. 
I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. I am blessed, I am called. feet are on the rock, our foundation is solid. We cannot stand there alone without the rock of salvation, the lover of your soul, our souls. He, there is nothing we can do without God. He is our rock, our strength, our fortress. He is our creator. Every one of us are blessed and called and healed and whole in the name of Jesus. That's how we get to our Father, is in Jesus' name. Mm. He is so, so good. This is my story. This is my song, praising, praising my, my Savior, Savior all the day long. Blessed assurance, glory divine, oh hallelujah, Jesus is mine. I pray that your footing would always be on that rock. As humans, it is hard, and we slip and fall, but he always will lift us back up. As long as we seek his face, call on his name, there is peace that comes. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation and something that should just rattle you and frazzle you, and this overwhelming peace that surpasses all understanding just washes upon you. That's our Lord. I just pray that there would be a song in your heart today and every day that you would stand on solid ground and that you would always look up and that there would be a, just praising your Savior all, day, all the day long. And all God's people come together in praise and worship. And we just want to glorify you, Lord. It is about you and you alone. And we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. My first day doing an announcement, so <laughs> hi, people online. <laughs> For you that don't know me, I'm Margarita, a.k.a. Hope. <laughs> um, so we have a few announcements today. F welcome all our new people. If you're here, new guests, we have a gift for you in, located in the back. Also, we have some connect cards so we can connect with you guys if you need prayers or just need someone to talk to. <laughs> Fill them out. You can drop them in the box right back there for our online group. You can go online to our website or our app. 
Living Grace. Um, let's see here. So, oh, we will be having a baptism after service at 1230 at the, woo, at the Private's Cove. <laughs> so if you, you know, if God has put it in your heart that you want to get baptized and give yourself to the Lord today, we're having it at 1230. For more information, um, see one of the pastors um, to get the address, and we'll see you guys there. And let's see. I'm, like, shaking right now. <laughs> and we're hosting, oh, women, Mother's Day tea. Woo! So <laughs> we'll be having another Mother's Day tea. It will be Saturday, May 13th at 1 p.m. The cost is $35. Um, please see us or me and my daughter back there at the table to sign up. Um, let's see. Men, we do need volunteers for the women's tea. Um, to help set up and break down. Let's see. Oh, and men. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I got you, baby. <laughs> um, the men's retreat will be at Ironwood Camp in California, uh, May 5th through 7th. Please register on our app or website, or as soon as possible. We need um, help with planning, and we need you guys there, man. It's very important. And then now our lovely Pastor Richard Box. <laughs> awesome. Um, hold, don't go nowhere. So, okay. so I think that's the first time I've been introduced as lovely, so thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, here, could you, could you just real briefly tell these folks how you came to Christ? I know, I know, no, we, we don't have 30 minutes. I'm like, do you have time for that? No, no just to give us a Cliff Notes version. I mean, I'm, obviously you're pretty fired up about Jesus. And yes. um, uh, what was the turning point for you? Um, for me, I, w I hit rock bottom. Um, if you guys don't know me, just keep it short. I was in addiction. I was on drugs for 13 years, um, out of my kid's life, just in darkness. Did not know God, never heard of God until I met my lovely husband. And um, just one night I had a spiritual awakening and I, I had drugs and everything and I was trying to get high. And I looked myself in the mirror and I felt like that was God speaking to me. I didn't even recognize who I was anymore. And I cried out to God and I was like, look, if you're real, if, this, if you're really real, please help me fight this addiction. Help me to not want to use anymore. The next day I went to a sober living and I haven't looked back since. Um, that, that was, uh, <laughs> thank you. That was actually June 5th of 2020. And then August 2nd of 2020, Pastor Richie baptized me. I was welcomed to the church and um, now I'm part of the women's ministry. Uh, my daughter is, I'm fully in my kid's life and got two boys going to college, I mean. God is good. and All the time. All the time. God and I do want to say, if God is tugging at your heart and you feel like you want that, you want to just start a new life with the Lord, I, I encourage you to get baptized today and give yourself to the Lord. He is who he says he is, and he met me where I was at, and God is so, so good. That's all I have. <laughs> That's all you have. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Pastor. She said, that's all I have. That's all I have. Let's go home. My gosh. Woo! Yay! Oh, you got that on tape, bro? You're a good husband. You're a good husband. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, I remember that day. I remember that day we baptized you. And, uh... huh? What? What, what? Make sure you what? Oh, I did, did I say that? Your old self is going to... Oh, anyway, um, I remember that day because the next day I was sick as a dog with COVID. Yay! And I was like, oh, no! Oh, you didn't know that? Yes, yeah, see, God protected you. And yes, the host... I was like, what in the world's wrong with me? Um, hey, yeah, so the baptism, uh, we, if you're, if you would like to, it, it was, you know, we can't always schedule things around, sometimes things just happen, 
And so if that's something you'd like to do, and you th if you're thinking, boy, I'd love to do that, but I don't, have, I don't have the appropriate attire, don't worry, we got you. We got stuff. We got shorts, we got shirts, we got water, we got Towel. towels, right? And you could even keep the towel. I'll let this, Pastor Richie, just let him have it. Let him have the towel. So, uh, <laughs> so if that was you, just let us know, okay? So we're going to... We're going to get through that. Um, I also um, wanted to give a quick re uh, recap about our Redberry outreach uh, that was amazing yesterday. We, um, uh, I've told you about this, this uh, uh, connection between about five different churches as well as Metro uh, for this area right off of um, Rancho and Cheyenne. I'm told that while we were there or in the, in, before or after, in the, in the short period of time that we were there, there were five different incidents that took place in that area, including um, a, a car that was stolen that was over, at, over in the parking lot near the 99 cent store. That they, because we were out there in front, Brian, and I don't see Brian, we were there and we were, we were telling people to come and looking for kids, really, or anybody, and all of a sudden we seen the police roll up and we're like, dang, and they found a stolen car because... Uh, Metro captain for the Northwest Area Command had told us that, I forget which month it was, that they had had like, like, uh, like 50 or 60 stolen cars in the Northwest Area Command. And he said most of them end up at Redberry. So anyway, uh, all that to say that God's on the move. And um, I want to show you a, a couple of pictures that we have just to give you a little, a little bit of context of what it was like. And so uh, these guys right here, uh, they were connected. Uh, one of them knew someone who went to a church, and they said, hey, we think it's great what you guys are doing. Can you, uh, 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 can, would you let us come and cut hair? And I'll tell you what, aside from the basket, well, I don't know, I think this was the most popular feature. Uh, all the, all, all the uh, kids, boys, uh, I don't know if they cut any girls' hair, but all the boys were like getting their hair, hair cut. And uh, I, I was, uh, before, we got there a little bit early, and the first person sitting in the chair was our youth pastor, Ray Ray. And I'm like, yo, what's up, man? This is what? He was like. I say, yeah, I got next, man, but I, I never made it back over there. So go ahead. Let's just uh, real quickly. Yeah, there's uh, one of the churches and, uh, that provided all the food and uh, um, all, all of the, yeah, they did an amazing job. Uh, keep going. Um, um, Metro booth with uh, information because they're, they're just trying to be a part of the community. Next one. And Bounce House, uh, courtesy of Calvary Chapel, or a uh, fervent church now, Calvary Chapel Lone Mountain. Uh, this may be a little bit difficult to see, but I thought it was important for you to get the feel for the outreach. Uh, that's our basketball hoop that's in our storage uh, facility next to the office. So it's, uh, I don't know, for some reason, someone thought it'd be good for the basketball hoop to go over there. So uh, we got a trailer last minute and got that thing loaded up and got that over there. And that was a big attraction as well. So there you go. Basketball, imagine that, right? Um, a, little bit of a, a little bit of a pickup game right there. Keep going. That's Brandon right there. You recognize the backside of your son. Yep. Uh, this picture right here, um, the, this one particular church brought like a whole bunch of Mountain Dew, like a whole bunch. And they bought cases and cases. And so they were raffling off all of this really cool stuff. And then they were, and then they were raffling off the Mountain Dew. And then they were like, anybody else want Mountain Dew? So uh, I saw Pastor Richard walking with these folks, and I'm not sure if that went, was his Mountain Dew or if that was theirs. I'm not sure. I saw him walk down the street, and then he disappeared, so I, cannot, I don't know where those two... He said something about CrossFit as he was walking down. I didn't buy it. I don't know. Just thought I'd throw that one in there. We got one more. Do we have a video or something else? We have next? That's it? Do we have... a? There you go. That gives, gives you a little feel. Roll that video. Redberry outreach just kind of beginning. The kids are all over there playing some basketball. The Gillis uh, Church is here. Liberty Church is here. The Good News Club is here. Metro Police is here. Living Grace is here. Uh, looking forward to really impacting and reaching this neighborhood for Jesus. Continue to pray for Redbird. There you go. And uh, is there one more picture you guys have? No? 
I thought, okay. Oh, in my message. Oh, I see. Oh, that little, <laughs> this little kid right here, what was his name? Do you remember? Elmer. Elmer. Come on, looks like Elmer, right? This little kid right here, he, um, it was his birthday. And so we all sang happy birthday to him. And then in the raffle, he won that, ba- what is that, uh, basketball, right? He won a basketball in the raffle. And Pastor Richard, like, right? Yeah, you could golf clap, golf clap, that's fine. And, uh, and so I'm like, I'm like, man, that is so cool, Pastor Richard. Like, today's his birthday, and he actually won something. Like, how cool is that, right? I mean, how many of you guys win something on your birthday? You know, when you're a kid, it, you know, and, and then Pastor Richard says, yeah, I could tell by a look on his face. He's like, yeah, 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 we kind of made sure he won. I went, oh, <laughs> oh, well, he don't have to know that, you know. It's like glory to God. Yay. Anyway, that was kind of cute. Did he? He wanted that ball? Oh, that's awesome. Anyway, right on. Uh, great time. Um, more to come. More to come. We're just getting started. We're just getting started. Um, let's all stand. Oh. Yeah, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the things that you have already done for the celebration that we're, uh, we're here together as family, corporately, Uh, One church, though we are many, we are one body, and we are here to celebrate, and we are here to grow, and that your word, Lord, would accomplish what it concerns, what concerns you in us today. Lord, we receive your word right now, whatever you would speak to our hearts, we say amen and yes, Lord, even now. And so we thank you, God, and we pray, Father, for the continued efforts of our outreach, whether it's across the street or across the globe that you would continue to prosper the work of our hands and that you would use us for your great name and for your glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Give someone a high five if you would, please. All right. So so two weeks ago, uh, I'm sorry, Saturday a week ago, we did a... um, a outreach, if you would, uh, Easter baskets ministry at the Budget Suites. If you're not familiar with that area, we've been ministering over there for many, many years. There's about 700, north of 700 apartment complexes that are weekly. And so there's lots of transition as well as lots of people who've been there for a long time. Ms. Aura spearheads that outreach and she does an amazing job and she has authority at that place. Um, And so Uh, This one was going to be different than ones we've done in the past. We were going to centralize it in the office, and uh, the the managers were working with us to make sure that uh, the people who were coming to get baskets were actually from the budget suites and not like, yeah, man, tell your cousin, tell your so-and-so, tell so and And pretty soon there's all these people and nobody recognizes them because it was specifically for this, this particular outreach was. And uh, so in the offices, you know, things were going well, families were coming in, uh, you know, there were some, it was, it, was, it was good. And for me, when I go to anything that's evangelistic or anything that's outreach, I'm, I'm like the parking lot guy. Uh, I'll go to an evangelistic thing and I'll be in the parking lot because I know there are people who come to the place but aren't sure if they could come in. Um, that's just me. Uh, I'm the one that's walking the grounds, inviting, talking trying to find a way to draw people in or have some God conversations. Um, I call that the ministry of presence or the ministry of hanging around. It's amazing the kind of conversations you have with people when you're just hanging around. So uh, it's a big, I don't know how many acres that place is. It's probably 10, 15 acres. I don't know. And, and I, I kind of walk one way, and I'm looking for young people or parents to invite them to bring their, because both the kid and the parent had to be there. So I, I walk to one side and, you know, talk to a few people, and then I walk to the back side, and then over this way, and then I make my way over here, and I'm having conversations and trying to give flyers to people. Everybody pretty much knows about it anyway. Go through the, wash, the washing room, the washing machine room, because there's a lot of people there. And then I make my way to this other end and I'm going to make my way back to the offices and as I do there's a grassy area that's um, uh, and I see a kid down there playing in it and so I go over there looking for a parent or someone 
that I could give a flyer to or tell. And so a woman says, oh, yes, no, he's already got his basket. We're good. I'm like, well, thank you. I, I, I turn and I reach, I see someone else and they, I, and they say to me, oh, can, can we come too? Can I come? I go, well, it's for kids. But um, she goes, well, I have grandkids. I said, well, of course, bring them. Well, they're not here. Well, they got to be here and you got to come with them. Okay, well, I'll get them here. Great. And, and then I, and then I, I turn and, 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 I, and I look to my right and this is what happens. And I go, I go, Come on, man. Come on. Come on. And I can't stop saying it because I see someone that I haven't seen in at least 10 years, maybe 12. And I'm like, come on, you come, come on. And I'm like, and, and have you ever like ran into someone and they have a look on their face like they're 99% sure it's you, but there's 1% that they're hoping it's maybe not you? But how many six, seven mixed dudes do you know who are pastors, right? <laughs> so that kind of six, six. So that kind of like I, that gives me away. <laughs> and 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 and, we're, and I'm like I'm like come on. I go. What do you call this? What do you call this? What do you call this? And he says, he says, y- you mean like the way I look? Because you know he's tatted up and you know he's. He's, he's in the streets, and I don't. I, that's not a value statement. He's he's not where he is supposed to be, and and I, I I didn't know that, but you know he confessed quickly, and 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 he said, he he said, you mean you mean like this? And I go, no, 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 no. That's not. Nobody cares about that. Why, of all the places, of all the times. And I come, I learned later, he doesn't even live there. His daughter lives there, so he was visiting her. And he happened to walk outside right when I walked all the way around to the point where we're face to face. And I haven't seen him in 10 plus years. And I said, no, why would God allow me to stand right here and to be looking at you eye to eye? I go, what do you call that? And he goes, coincidence? I go, come on, man. Come on, we don't believe in coincidence. You know that. And we had some conversation, and he said this. He said, let me ask you a question, Pastor Richie. All those things my mama used to tell me and used to pray over me and talk about what I would be, and all those things that you said about me for years, do you believe that God can still use me for those things? It is beyond amazing to me when you haven't seen someone in years that that is the question they ask you. It's amazing. It's astonishing to me. We're in the book of Judges, chapter 6. God wants to use you to do something significant I didn't say big, because we think that if it's not big, it's not significant. That's not true. God wants to use you, you, to do something significant for Him. I know what you're thinking. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. God, God, I don't know. Why would God use me? I don't know the Bible that well. I'm, kind of, I'm still kind of, I've been a Christian a long time, but I'm not real well versed in the scripture. You know, I've got anger issues. You know, I'm not, I'm not always real spiritual, Pastor. Oh, I love it when someone says this to me. You know, Pastor, I'm not perfect. And every time you tell me that, I'm going to say the same thing. So please don't be offended if you tell me this. I'm going to say, we already know you're not perfect. <laughs> Nobody is. And they go, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad we got that out of the way. I'm not really talented. You know, occasionally I doubt, I have fears. Pastor, you don't know my story. You don't know my story. No, you don't know the story of some of the people in this room. You might be like, man, I'm getting out of here. (laughs) I'm an introvert. I'm not a good speaker or whatever it is. You ever felt that way? Well, if you have, you're in good company. Because the Bible is filled 
with stories of people who did not see in themselves what God saw in them. And they were able to do amazing exploits because they believed in what God said and not what they didn't know about themselves. Gideon is a perfect example of this. In the book of Judges, it is a hard time for Israel. Judges is about cycles. And it's a cycle of a nation that is walking with God, and then they begin to worship false gods and thereby stray away from God. And then he warns them, and eventually he sends them into captivity, and they're in captivity for X amount of years. And then at some point they come to their senses and they cry out to God. And God raises up a deliverer to set them free. And then they walk in unity and in peace and provision and the blessing of God. That's basically the story of Judges. It's been seven years of oppression by the Midianites. Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. The threshing of wheat is that, is that winnowing fork that, that blows the wheat and separates the, the wheat from the chaff so that that can be used. It's normally done on a flat surface with the wind blowing uh, so that it, um, uh, it, it's much easier to do it that way. Interesting to note that Gideon is in a wine press. Why? Because the Midianites are roaming through there. They have the nation of Israel on lockdown. And if they do this publicly, it will all be taken. They, they're barely made. They're the people of God, and they are barely getting by. There's, they're, they're, because they have chosen to not to worship false gods, they are living in spiritual bankruptcy. And when you worship false gods, you end up spiritually bankrupt. And in this case, it manifests itself in a very real way. They're starving. They're barely surviving. That's probably a better word. Well, in that context, God steps into the scene in chapter Chapter 6, verse 10 says, you have not obeyed my voice. That's the why. That's why there, remember we talked about last week, if you're with us sometimes, it's because of your choices. This is their choice. So, it says in verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terrible tree, which was an Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Ab Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord. It's interesting the questions that people ask when you haven't seen them in a long time. He doesn't know he's talking to the angel of the Lord. Uh, I don't know, uh, or, or, or this could be the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. We don't know, but it's interesting the question that he asked because it reveals the state of where his heart is. Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, uh, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? I find that it is much easier to talk about and complain about issues than it is to be willing to do something about it. And I promise you, if you and I have a conversation and you're like, we need to do this or we need to do that, I'm probably going to say, that's a great idea. When do you want to get started? <laughs> oh, no, I, I wasn't volunteering. I'm just saying someone should do it. And I'm saying, no, you have the passion, clearly. <laughs> now you're like, I'm never going to say that. It's like when I was a teacher and I'd say, all right, I need a volunteer. And no one would raise their hand. 
don't. <laughs> anyway, y'all didn't get that. The teacher in the back got it. Oh. But Lord, Gideon replied, um, Oh yeah, why is this happening? Verse 14, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Here's his response. Verse 15, So he said, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Oh, it's awesome. Some things to know about why God would use you and the things that are part of being used by God. I want you to recognize first and foremost, he says, number one, I am sending you. God said, no, 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 I'm sending you. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm authorizing you to go and I'm giving you the authority to accomplish this mission. And he even tells him what the end result will be like. A lot of times when God calls us on ministry or on mission, we don't know what the end result is going to be. It's like, well, what do you, what do you expect to accomplish out of this? I don't know, but I'm just going. <laughs> The Lord is sending him. Number two, he says, I will be with you. You're not going alone. In other words, not only am I sending you, but I'm going to accomplish things that you will not be able to accomplish on your own. And he says, I'm sending you, and I will be with you. You know what that tells me? That tells me that God sees things within us that we don't always see or know about ourselves. If we leave it to our abilities or what we think we're gifted at or what we think we can accomplish, we will always fall short of what God wants to do because we will come to a place of our limit versus stepping into a place of the limitless God. And God sees things, he saw things in Gideon that Gideon did not see about himself. He doesn't see himself as a mighty warrior. He doesn't see himself as one who could lead a nation into battle. He's in a wine press threshing wheat because he doesn't want the Midianites to take it from him. And that's the man that God chooses for this mission. Let me say a little bit about success because I think we have kind of a messed up view of success in the church. Success is following the command of the Lord. The results are up to him. Someone might say, for example, well, how did the Redberry outreach go? How many people came to Christ? I don't know. Oh, well, how many people from that area have shown up to your church? So far, none. Well, then, what, did, what, was, what were you guys trying to accomplish? We were just trying to be obedient to the Lord because we've been praying about that area for years. And there's a group of churches that all come together and we're all on, on target to do the same thing. And so success isn't measured in numbers. Success, how many people were there? Honestly, I really wish more teenage years were there, like let's say, I don't know, 15, the gun-carrying boys who are 14 to 16. 17, they're the ones shooting and looting, many of them. I wish more of them were there. No, not so much. More of the younger kids. I wish more of the adults would have actually come, but you have to understand in a neighborhood where if you talk to the police, you might be in danger. They're a little bit skeptical of coming out, even to something that is so nice uh, 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 because the police are there. And they don't want to feel retribution. They don't want to be seen talking to police. And so there's this gap and this trust that has to be done. It's not quite there yet. And plus, that was our first time there. Those people don't even know us. And they don't even know yet that we're coming back. We say we're coming back, and we had better come back. Because it's not about taking pictures and feeling good that we did something great for the kingdom when we accomplished nothing on our own. 
Oh, we had, we had the gospel being preached. We had, we had uh, 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 gospel music permeating that neighborhood. As far as we know, that's never happened before. Was it successful? You bet it was successful. And here's why it was successful. We went there and we stood there and we, and we told people the good news and we played music and we had fun. I let the kids beat me in basketball. <laughs> and some of the leaders that were helping us were like wanting to challenge me in basketball. I said, no, challenge Blake. <laughs> Yeah, have some. <laughs> Get served. <laughs> Let Blake serve you up this morning. Ah, <laughs> oh, my son, if you don't know that. That's success. We don't know uh, if any of those parents who were a, a few ha- uh, apartments back were, were, were touched by God. We don't know it, the, the significance of, 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 of what will happen because the gospel came into that neighborhood. We don't know the, 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 the redemption and lift that will take place because when the gospel comes in, neighborhoods are lifted up. No, but if you want numbers, I got nothing for you. There should have been more people there than what there were there, but the ones that were there were blessed. And they got a, they got a glimpse of love and, this, and was a safe environment because when you live in a, I will not use the term war zone, I think it's inappropriate to even use that. All respect to our military people. But when you live in a neighborhood like that, then at times, as I mentioned to you a few weeks ago, someone shot off 200 rounds of ammo in the apartments across the street and no one got, no one got hit. When you live in an area like that and there's a, a group of people that are smiling and seem pretty friendly and are talking about Jesus who have bounce houses and basketball and, 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 and really games with balloons that were really cool. We got to steal that idea. Uh, and, 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 and the police are there so it's safe and you can tell your kids, go out and play, come back in two hours or whenever they're done. And maybe, just maybe, those parents will make their way over someday too. Because we're coming back. You know what that call that? That's success. That's success. You think, we, you think we went there for numbers and results? Are you kidding me? No. We went there because God told us to go. If anything good comes out of it, if anyone comes to Christ, if anything has any lasting value, it's because God does it, not because of us. Sorry. It ain't about you. And it ain't about me. God's going to do what God's going to do, and God's going to get all the glory. And that's the way it is. And we're happy to be a part of that. <laughs> By His grace, we're happy to be a part of that. Successful, you bet. Well, how much did you spend? Go away. <laughs> Go away. Was it worth your investment? Stop it. You're thinking in nickels and dimes, and God's thinking in souls. Not you, I'm saying people, some, first service. <laughs> not you, not, not you, not you here. <sighs> and we'll continue to go until God tells us not to. Judges chapter 11, there's another story of how God um, uses people, how God chooses people that maybe aren't the first choice. It's the story of a man named Jephthah. He's a, he's a, a warrior. Uh, it says in uh, chapter 11 of Judges, now Jephthah, this is another uh, judge that God's raising up to deliver Israel. Okay? And it says, now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, but was the son of a harlot. Oh, why does the Bible put that in there? I mean, do we have to go there? Like Jephthah, his whole life probably heard that. You're son of a prostitute. Yeah, whatever, dude. Get out of my face. Yeah, who's your mama? I don't know. It, why does it put that there? Like, why? 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 Like, you know what? It, we, do we really need to know all that? Yes. Yes, because that's the storyline of God's grace. And that God chooses people sometimes that we wouldn't choose. And so the Bible is clear to share the life of men and women in the Bible 
warts and all. This man was the result of a prostitute. Reggie Dabbs, at one time, was the number one requested high school assembly speaker. Number one, Reggie Dabbs. And part of his story is his mother was a prostitute. He will say to those kids when he talks about value and how much you matter to God, he will say, I don't even know who my father is. I'm the product of a $30 transaction. And look at him now because God created a new category. And God picked one that you probably many would not have picked and raises him up to do great exploits. Jephthah's mother was a, a harlot. It says in verse 2, Gideon's wife bore sons, and when his wives grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And you get the, the context that he dealt with this all the time. Nothing like feeling like an outsider in your own home. This was not his choice, by the way. He had nothing to do with this. Nor was there anything he could do to change it. And he was ridiculed because of it. It says, Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men banded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. Cast out from his own family, forced to live with the stigma of where his mama had come from, but here's the funny thing, is when Israel needed a ruler, when God was raising up a judge to bring them back into a place of worship and to bring freedom from the Midianites, who does he choose? He chooses Jephthah. That's not the one that most people would have chosen. And I can picture Jephthah when they came to him, I can picture Jephthah doesn't say this, but I can picture him saying, oh, oh, wait, 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 oh, 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 wait a minute, hey, guys, come on, all my worthless homies, all my worthless, no good, no, good for nothing homies. Go ahead, say that again. You, I just want to make sure I'm hearing, I'm, it doesn't say this, please. I'm just making, I just want to be sure you want me to deliver you from battle. <laughs> Tell you what, man. You fight your battles, I'll fight mine. How many people would have said, there ain't no way I'm coming back to put my life on the line for you? No, but there was something within his heart. I don't know if it's forgiveness. I don't know if there's something in his heart. Probably just God moving in his heart where he went back with all his worthless homies. And he led the army. And you should read his testimony of the nation of Israel, his historical accuracy. This man, was, this man knew his history. And even though his mama was a prostitute, he knew the story of his people. And it came a time when he needed to tell the enemies of God the story because there was land that these people wanted back. And Jephthah told them, it's not your land. Look at some of the things he says in verse 23, part of his response. And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people. Should you then possess it? Will you not possess whatever Shemosh, your God, gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord our God takes possession of before us, we will possess. Is that awesome? He's like, yo, let me break it down to you, man. You trust your God for your land. We're going to trust God for ours. And so if we got all this land, then you know what? There's a problem because our God, you, your problem is with our God because he's the one who gave us this. And it says in verse 32, So Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. So that, there you go. There's the key. There it is. That's that same, it's the Lord who does it. I wrote this down, the Lord chooses to use people despite their past or the public perception of them. The Lord chooses to use people that, that have a shady background, like maybe this man. Another thing is that God often sends us back to the place of pain, defeat, and loss in order to bring deliverance to others stuck in that place. Oh, I, I think I shared this with you last Sunday, but I saw it again in action as there were guys who came with us to the neighborhood who, ha who, understand, who have the authority to go back to those people, their people, and speak 
uh, about their story and they have the authority to go because they've been there. They've been called by God to go back to the place of hurt and pain and the place of struggle that God has delivered them from and let them young people know there's hope and there's freedom in Jesus. And they look at them and they say, you know what, I think you might be right. But again, only God can do that. It's not because of what we've been through that people come to know him. It's because God takes us out of what we've been through and causes us to grow and to be healed and to move forward so that we can reach others for his glory. A few more things about why God would use you or how God could use you. God uses the insecure. The insecure. Ah. Uh, I'm not that confident. I got news for you. I'm not that confident. Sometimes my wife says to me, she says, are you sure? And I go, nope. (laughs) I'm so sorry to tell you this. Yeah. Yeah. When I came into the ministry, man, it was a call I wasn't expecting. I just knew that what I was doing, I was done where I was at. You ever had that feeling? I'm done. I'm done. And I didn't want to just rush off into nothingness, although I probably could have, but I just, I don't know if the, how, how smart that would have been, but, and I get the call to come. Nobody knew this. I'm, 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 I'm working downtown, looking out over the west end of the, of, the, of the city, and I'm like, you know, I could stay here forever. This could be a cushion. I could retire at 50 and live large. Maybe not. <laughs> I get a phone call to come into the ministry, and I'm like, what? I'm like, no, 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 and no. Why not? Because I'm down here with the people. I'm with the homies. I'm serving. I'm a youth pastor. I don't want to be a pastor because I had this image that that's them up there and the people are down here, probably from my old Catholic background. No disrespect to any Catholics, but you know how it is. I'm like, nah, nah, I can't do it. And, 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 and well, would you at least pray about it? Oh, yeah, I'll pray about it. But uh, eh. Well, anyway... Long story short is I made that move, and, and, and people would say, one guy said, I remember it, are you sure, are you absolutely sure that God has called you to do this? And I went, nope. <laughs> not really, not sure, but I feel like it's, I feel like it's okay. I had told this, the, the pastors at the church, I said, I, I, I don't want to preach for one, at least a year. Not, I don't want to preach. Don't put me up front. Don't. And then I also said, I'll give you a one-year commitment. <laughs> because I'm going to go be a missionary in Hong Kong. I'm going to do sports ministry on the Pacific Rim, and I'm gone. I, 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 mean, I'll, I mean, I'll come for a minute, but I'm not going to be here that long. I, I, <laughs> 30 years later. <laughs> and you know what? Here's the funny thing is the confirmation of that change didn't happen till. Till after, when I got a supernatural confirmation where I, uh, this is you, God, okay, appreciate it, could have told me this a week ago, yeah, (laughs) not that you've ever said that to God, that was just me. God uses the insecure. How about Moses? Moses said in Exodus, as he's going back and forth with God, like, God, you have the wrong man, essentially. He says, But suppose they do not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Verse 10, then Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am uh, not eloquent, uh, neither before or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Verse 11, so the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes the mute, the deaf, seeing, the blind? Uh, Have I not, uh, have not I the Lord Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. And finally, verse 13, Moses says, Oh, oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whoever whoever else you may send. God, send someone else. Like, I'm not the guy. This man who, who who was trained in all of the ways of the Egyptians for 40 years and was in line to be one of the top leaders in Egypt, 
left all of that, spent 40 years in the wilderness tending sheep because he had to be deprogrammed of all of that Egyptian way of thinking and he had to be brought down to the true humility that he needed to be at so that God could use him and raise him up to lead a nation and to face that which he had escaped from. He gets rescued from Egypt so he can go back to Egypt. But this time, it's a different mindset. Oh, you might say I'm not an outgoing person. Uh, I'm an introvert. I don't even like people. That's okay. Oh, yeah, I'm too old. No, you're not. Oh, I'm too young. Not really. Well, you might be, but not really. I don't have a lot of self-confidence. Great. Here's a new word. Godfidence. Godfidence. This is what I need because I'm not secure. I go back and forth. I don't always know. People say, what do you think, man? What's God going to do? I'm like, you got me, bro. What do you got? What? You don't know and you're the pastor? Yeah. Some of you know me too well. You're laughing at that. <laughs> but I need confidence. It's not confidence in me or my abilities. It's confidence in God and what God will do. Because guess what? God makes up the difference between where I am and what he wants. And I cannot do that on my own. If I do, it'll fail and fall and look real bad. <laughs> Fleshy. So God uses, you feel insecure? Perfect. God uses the unlikely. Craig Rochelle said this, if you're the smartest, funniest, most talented, best athlete, God can still use you. Prefers the ordinary people. God specializes in using those that others overlook. In the book of 1 Samuel, God sends the prophet Samuel to go and anoint the next king because Saul's not working out. Saul cares too much about Saul. Saul's in it for Saul. He's not in it for the kingdom. He's not in it for God. And he's about to be replaced. God sends the prophet over to Jesse's house. He's got seven sons. And, and, and they want to, one of those sons is going to be the next king. Could you imagine the, the pomp and the circumstance and the, and the, and the, and the pageantry and, and the prophet's coming and he's going to anoint the next king and he's going to be one of my sons. Oh, and it says in 1 Samuel 16, 6, so it was when they came, the prophet looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, this man on all outward accounts was the perfect choice for this, but it was just one problem. It wasn't God's choice. So it says in verse 8, Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made Shema pass by. And he says, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. He doesn't even get invited to come and stand before Samuel because he's the punk brother. And his brothers have disdain towards him. And he grows up. You can't, you can't help but grow up in that kind of dysfunction and not be a little dysfunctional yourself. You can't help but have a little bit of confidence issues or, or, or to, be, to, to, to always feel like you're, you're, you're never invited, like, you're, you're like you don't even count. It's almost like maybe, maybe David didn't think this, but you could truly understand where he might say, you know what, I'm like, I'm like I don't even matter to my family. It's like all they care about are the sheep and that the sheep are okay. That's it. He doesn't even get invited to come in. But what they don't know is that God knew something about David that they didn't know. And God knew that David was a man after his own heart. And God also knew that this young man was a warrior. Because while these boys are in the house painting their toenails or whatever, I don't know what. 
<laughs> he's out. <laughs> he's out there with the with the talking, you know, a, a lion or a bear comes to take one of his lambs and he's like, oh no, not today. And he chases them down and by his own testimony says he would capture them and grab them. How do you take a lamb out of a lion's mouth? I don't even know. I would present to you that God was watching over that boy and he had, he had supernatural, not so much strength, but wisdom. I don't know what you call that because <laughs> I call it crazy. But God was preserving his life. And he was preparing him in the wilderness for something. And so while they thought that he was an outcast and he was a nobody and he's never going to amount to anything but just looking out for sheep, God said, no, that's my choice to lead my people. And he'll be the, one of the if not the greatest king in Israel's history. Not your choice. God's choice. Because he often chooses the overlooked. I love this. This is great. I just, I just picture this and I just like have lots of fun with it. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. I just picture the scene. Please forgive me, but I just picture, I just picture him going, bring it in, brothers, older brothers, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. Oh, and they're like, oh, no, yeah, little bra is about to get paid. I'm just kidding. He's about to be the king of Israel. And after that, what did he do? Went back out to tending sheep. It's amazing. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Whew. Oh, oh, yeah. Watch out for this kid. Oh, my. Samuel was looking for the obvious. God chose the unlikely. Man looks at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. We must be careful in the church when we begin to look at the outward appearance and believe that that means something spiritual is there because it may not mean that. We must be careful when we look at what we define as success in church and say someone's anointed or gifted or blessed because we just see the outside. I was reading an article about a man who was wildly popular, who had a massive ministry in New York City. And by all accounts, that would be considered a successful ministry on the outside. The only problem is his family was falling apart. And he was, he, it, it came out that he had multiple affairs outside of his marriage. And that his leadership style was harsh and autocratic. And so he was asked to step down. On the outside, everything was successful and great, but guess what? God looks at the heart. And this man stepped down for six months, and he's back in ministry again. Whether that's right or wrong, I'm not going to judge because I don't know anything that's happened in those six months. It seems rather quick to me in this article that I was reading, there was a seasoned pastor to pastors who, counsel, who has counseled many, many, many men that have failed in ministry because of things like this. And he said, in his estimation, it takes 10 years. 10 years to sit and to be deprogrammed of all of the training and all of the stuff that got you into that place. Whether or not this man is okay to minister or not, I, 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 I don't know. I, six months? My personal opinion. Don't know the man. Don't know what he's been through. Don't know the condition of his family. But that sounds rather quick to me. God uses the unlikely because God looks at the heart. God uses the broken. You might remember the story of Peter. Peter, a man's man. Peter, Peter, don't, don't mess with Peter. Don't mess with him. Like, like if, if you bump into Peter 
in line at the movie theater is going to be some stuff because he's like that. I'm like, oh, man, you done b bumped into Peter, man. Back up, everybody. <laughs> Peter would have a, 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 a bumper sticker that says, if you don't like my driving, get off the sidewalk. That would be Peter. <laughs> He'd probably have a gun rack in the back and probably like, look, man, I told you, boy. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Um, you remember Peter and how he's having a conversation with Jesus about how he's ride or die. He will never forsake Jesus. He, he's there. there he's going to protect him. He's, he's going to, and, and, and Jesus says, you know, like three times, you will deny me three times tonight. And Peter's like, no, no he, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a man that's full of pride and he's self-centered and he's, self-confident and he's been with Jesus for three years and he still doesn't get it and and he's about to learn the most powerful lesson of his life when um, Jesus is being tried basically facing the death penalty we know how that went it's an illegal trial and Peter is out in a courtyard with other people and he's warming himself He's at a distance. He's close enough to see Jesus and maybe even hear, but he's, he's, he's keeping his distance. And it says in Luke twenty two fifty six, 56, a certain servant girl seeing him as he sat by the fire looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. But he denied him saying, woman, uh, uh, I don't know him. And then in verse 58, and while a little while, uh, uh, in a little while, another saw him and said, you also were one of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And then after an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're saying. And it says, immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord, oh, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Okay, the Lord is engaged in some heavy stuff. They're th hurling accusations at him. It, it's, he, he knows he's going to die. And in the midst of this incredibly stressful situation, the rooster crows and Jesus turns and looks at Peter. A and it says this, Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Many would say there's no coming back from that. You can't, you can't, bro, you're done. Many of you might say, man, 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 my past, what I've done, what I did, how I've lived my life, you can't come back from that. You might even say, listen, man, I know there's no hope for me. This, this message is for, it's not for me because this is, you don't know me. You can't come back from where I've been. Let me assure you this morning that Jesus is able to bring you back from where you've been. And not only that, to send you back to be a light to those that are still trapped in darkness. And we had a glimpse of that today with some testimony. And I tell you, we could have, if not all of you, come up here and, take, and tell five minutes of how Jesus has set you free and how Jesus has used you. Not everybody comes back, unfortunately. After his resurrection, Jesus forgives Peter. Mark chapter 16, verse 8, two words. Everybody say, and Peter. Say that, and Peter. Here we go. It says this, Mark 16, 6. But he said to them, this is, this is uh, the conversation that is being had at the tomb with the tomb empty where the women are there and, 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 they, and they're really concerned about who's going to roll away the stone and they get there and the stone is rolled away. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We're working on it. All right. And the Lord turned. Uh, wait a minute. Where am I at? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. Isn't that interesting? 
that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Why does Peter get singled out? Man, because he's busted and broken and dejected and just crushed. Can I say to you that the manhood in him, the pride, the arrogance, the self-centeredness is just been broken because the one thing that he swore he would never do, even to the Messiah, he did. So go tell Peter. Two disciples are on the road to Emmaus. They're having a conversation with Jesus, but they don't know that it's Jesus. They find out later, and they go and they tell the other apostles, Luke 24, 34, and they say, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. It seems that Jesus had a one-on-one -on -one with Peter before he met the other disciples. Oh, wouldn't you love to know how that conversation went? Oh, man, we don't get to know. That's all right. But it was good because guess what? We get to Acts chapter 2, and Peter stands up, and he thunders over and speaks the gospel message and gives this incredible history lesson of his people because he knows the history of his people. He knows the story of God moving in his people. And he preaches the gospel message, and thousands come to know Christ. Peter? Mr. I'll never, I'll never forsake you. Mr. Yeah, yeah, that guy, that guy. He's been filled with the Spirit of God, and he's, he's in a new category now, and God is using him for his glory. Mr. Insecurity, Mr. Unlikely, yeah, Mr. Broken. Perfect. Who could better preach about forgiveness than the one who had been forgiven so much? Why does God use the insecure and the unlikely, and the broken. It's for His glory and His great name. So let me leave you with these two things. you got to step out in order to find out. you got to step out in order to find out. Moses had to go because God said, now go. Moses had to go. And he said, I'll give you the words to say. If Moses hadn't gone, he would have never known the words that he, were, that he was going to have to say, or he would have never known the rest of the story. All he said was go deliver the people. God didn't tell him how. He had to step out. David had to fight a giant. He had to run. He had to pick a rock, and he had to go. Gideon, the Lord said, I'm sending you, Gideon. Gideon had to go. Jehoshaphat, it says, advanced toward the enemy. Jehoshaphat had to get up, and he had to go. Peter, you've been forgiven, and guess what? You could have just sat back in that forgiveness and say, I am so glad that I've been forgiven by the Lord. But guess what? He had to get up, he had to stand up, and he had to go preach the gospel. And he did. So, <clears throat> this young man, now I'll leave it for the end of the end. I read this, I thought it was kind of cool. Noah got drunk, I don't know if you're aware of that. Abraham was too old, Isaac was a daydreamer, Jacob lied, had a problem with the truth. Leah was unattractive, Joseph was abused, Moses was a murderer who apparently couldn't talk straight. Gideon was afraid, Samson was a womanizer and full of pride. Rahab was a prostitute, Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Elijah wanted to die. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. The Samaritan woman was divorced multiple times. Zacchaeus was too small, and he was a tax collector. Paul was a murderer. Timothy had stomach issues, and Lazarus was dead. What's your excuse? <laughs> I really mean that. Do you think it's not all hands on deck right now? Do you think it's okay for you not to be on mission or not to be uh, in ministry? In, in, in the capacity that God has called you? Do you really think that? 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We need everybody. And it's not for us. It's not for Living Grace Church. It's not for us. It's for Him, for His glory. Remember the words of Paul. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7. We are vessels. We are broken vessels. And God takes cracked pots and He pours into them His light and His grace so that those cracked pots can pour out on others who might come to know the Savior as well. So this young man asked me this question. Do you think that God can still use me? And I'm telling you, aside from the prayer of his, of, of his mom, his whole life, and, the, and, and, the, and, the, and the, the men of God who have spoken into his life, which I was one of them, God blessed me to be able to do that, and spent time with him and ministered to him and, 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 and told him, this is, this is, you will influence people one way or another. God has a purpose and a plan. Will you, will you step out? And I told him, I said, I believe the only one who can stop you from everything that God has for you is you. You. Let's all stand. This is not a call for you to sign a piece of paper in the back. Now, we need servants, we need children's ministry. We, uh, that's not it. It's much, much bigger than that. This is a call for you to step into all that God has. It's an invitation to join Him in the greatest possible missions work of all time reaching people, teaching people, raising up people, joining him in what he is doing. This is a call to join Christ in what he is doing. Will you answer that call? Will you? And if you're not sure exactly what that is, we would be more than happy to stand alongside of you and help you in that journey. But make no mistake about it. First and foremost, it is about you knowing him not about doing for him but knowing him and there might be some here this morning that have just never asked jesus into your heart you've never repented you've never you've never acknowledged that he is god and that you need a savior you don't need to convince a drowning person that they need a, a life vest He's much, much more than that. And maybe you've never made that confession. And I want to challenge you today that if that is you today, you would agree with God, that you would acknowledge that, that, that for some of you that God has been, and I hate to use this word, pursuing you your whole life. But you've been, you've, 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 you've run from Him. You've run from the things that he might have for you. And maybe, just maybe today, you would say, God, I'm done running. I'm done. I'm done. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Here I am. Make of me whatever you want because I know it'll be better than what I am. Maybe you would say, God, I, I ask your forgiveness 
I'm, I'm in, I, I need you. Like, you know that. And there's a confession with your mouth, an agreement that you must make. Or if you're just someone that's been satisfied just coming to church and reading the Bible, but you're not stepping out, that maybe today you would say, Lord, I'm ready. Maybe it's by his grace that you're, you're, you're ready to make a step into mission or into ministry, that today would be that day. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word and to, and to sharpen one another. God, we look forward to all that you have for us and all that you want to do. Lord, would you pour out a blessing into these broken vessels that we might pour out a blessing on others and give honor and glory to you, for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. I would just say uh, before we go, a couple of things that if, if you made that covenant in your heart, you just felt like, man, that was totally me. Um, in the back, we have some information that we'd like to share with you. We want to we join you. Imagine signing up for a team, but never going to practice or never being a part of the team. Well, you're not on the team. We want you to sign up, so to speak, with the Lord, but we also want you to join us, and we'd love to help you in that. Back there is more information on how to do that. Also, again, if you're a guest, please, um, we have something that we'd like to give you. And, um, and again, if you want to be baptized, uh, even today, man, we got that happening in a short period of time. So, um, Lord bless you guys. And uh, communion elements are up here as well. Anyway, God bless. Take care. Thank you so much.